Hey, I'm Glenn Mazzara. I'm a writer showrunner who has worked on The Shield. I was a showrunner on The Walking Dead, Crash, Hawthorne, Damien, which I created, and uh, just recently shot a, a pilot for Amazon. I associate you in my head strongly with our guild, with the Writers Guild. Yeah, I was a board member and I do a lot of panels there, a lot of member education. I'm the co-chair of the Inclusion and Equity Group. So we work hard, just make sure that Hollywood takes steps to be as inclusive as possible. And how do we educate members so that they succeed when they get a job? We've established a staff writer boot camp that has trained over 500 staff writers on um, what is the job they're getting. I could have used a boot camp when I was a staff writer. <laughs> it's, it's important. It's really valuable because you don't know when to open your mouth or when not or how to read the, you know, the situation. And, you know, we've been able to kind of help people figure out not only how to write, that's part of the job, but there's a lot of politics, a lot of social dynamics, a lot of just how do you manage your reps, like all of that stuff. Writers don't really get that. You kind of have to learn on the go. We could start with the whole, how did Glenn become a writer thing? Or we could start with this thing that feels so topical to me right now, because today is about, it's either day 11 or day 12 of like worldwide George Floyd protests. So people who are watching this are probably seeing other interviews that I did before that and conversations I did before that. But mm -hmm. I feel like the tone of the conversation has changed very dramatically in the last week or so in our industry. And it's, interesting to me because you and I have been having this conversation for a few years. <laughs> Every time I see you, that's what we talk about. That's what we talk about. Yeah. Where should we start? We're going to get to all of it, but I wonder what's, what is top of mind for you right now? There's a couple of things. There's one, I think that as white people in the industry, we have to acknowledge that there's a tremendous amount of systemic racism, okay? Whenever I've come across it and you hear people say stuff, you hear people make decisions based on race, I think that people have been openly hostile, at least in conversations that I've had, against Black people. The level of racism is really outrageous. We did a survey of the Guild, you know, of members right after the Me Too movement about sexual harassment, but we came back with a tremendous amount of racial harassment. And these are writers abusing other writers. So it exists. And I think what we need to do is acknowledge that, talk about, okay, how can I use my privilege to amplify voices, to help voices, to, to hire people, to change the culture, to actually support people who are not in the system or not getting as far as they need to in the system? How do we help them overcome those obstacles? But then also, how do we kind of run block? If something comes up in a writer's room, you know, someone is, is shutting down a black writer or a female writer or someone of color, how mm -hmm. do we call that out? You know, when maybe we're afraid of, you know, ramifications uh, against ourselves. We have to do that. I think we're past the, the point of being silent. And yet we don't want to be the white savior. We don't want to do that. So what I'm finding, and I've had some painful conversations with people over the past 12 days, and it's really about conversations like this in which everybody's included in the conversation, in which we're talking to people, we're saying, how can I help? This is what I'm thinking about, what works for you, that kind of stuff. There's not just one path forward. It has to be... No everybody working together and in conjunctions. The storytelling is a big part of that. And I think we have to be open to telling other stories. And I'm working on a mm -hmm. script today. And I was just, you know, I had a, a woman who's a federal agent, she's given a speech. And I just said, well, okay, how, how is this speech different today than it was last week? You know, I conceived of it a couple of weeks ago. And I'm writing it. And I kind of went in and sort of acknowledged what was happening and what was being said. It's not so that it feels of the moment, but so that that character is also trying to process it, what's going on. So I think those stories are important. So, But I also think that Hollywood has to improve what we put on the screen and, and how we make what we put on the screen. You know, the stuff behind the scenes is really important. I really hope we're not just going to see lip service. You know, I really hope we're not just going to see a lot of fanfare. Hollywood's very good at patting themselves on the back about yep. inclusion. They're very good about saying everyone else is full of bullshit and they're not. Yeah, I'm having the same feeling about how this is sort of dominating the news cycle right now, which is good, but I always get a little scared when that happens that there will be a next news cycle and people will move on to the next thing. And I think a lot of this will come down to values. I think the people who discuss it, 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 they see it as a value and other people just think it's, oh, this is just what we're discussing this week. So all of the, the growth that we're facing now as a nation 
that has to be internalized. That has to be a value. We have to say people are treated, need to be treated fairly. They need to be treated equally. People should not be discriminated against, both in a fictional narrative and the people you're working with. Mm -hmm. I would really hope that the people who do value this now keep that voice and realize that's important and you have a right to speak up and an obligation to speak up. Before you and I hopped on, I thought, well, here we are, two white people about to talk about this moment where anti-racism is the subject mm -hmm. in our industry and in the country. And um, is that fucked up? You know, but I actually think it's like, this is our obligation. It's like, I've always been really reluctant to put that obligation on people who are already having a harder time of it. So I actually think it's good that you and I are, you know, if nothing else, just going, yeah, we're talking just worlds, just so you know, we're talking about it. We don't have all the answers, but we're committed to talking about it. Part of white supremacy is the idea that being white is not having a race and that issues of race are restricted to people of color. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's everyone else's problem. Mm -hmm. That's not right. That's not right. Issues of, of racism affect us all. You know, it may not affect us as painfully as it affects a black person, but we profit from that system. So that's screwed up. So we need to all sort of talk about this. And I think when people say, well, why are white people talking about it? Well, you want white people to talk about it. You want everybody to talk about it. This is mm -hmm. a, an entire system that needs to be torn down and reconfigured in a way that's equal for everybody. So therefore, everybody needs to be part of that conversation. If it's always, you know, us and the, uh, them and we and you and all of that, that's everybody has to come together. So, so I've been thinking about this, like, what right do I have as a white person to talk about race? I have a responsibility to talk about race. You know, we all do. And so, so I think it's a trick to say you shouldn't talk about it. People can feel free to say, who the fuck is that guy? He should shut up. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. And people will say that. But uh -huh. but the people who say that are kind of the people who don't want to hear it. I don't know. I feel like my learning curve just in the past week has been steep and um, uncomfortable and good in that way. And that's what we want. We want, you know, I mean, I've had conversations that have made me uncomfortable. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? It's being accepting of a multiple simplicity of viewpoints. So, you know, I may say something and someone may call me out on that. Somebody else may agree. Yeah, oh, I don't know. They're painful conversations. They're, these are painful conversations. Mm -hmm. And what is heartening, I think, is that when we have these painful conversations with writers, writers come away affected and then they end up writing that and putting that on the screen. Mm -hmm. And that changes. You know, we may, we're lucky enough to tell stories that millions of people see or you millions Millions of people say me, three or four people watch my shows. But anyway, so, <laughs> <God shut up. laughs> so, so <laughs> we're able to kind of work through our, yeah. our stuff and kind of put it out there and, and engage with the, the fans and, and can be part of that larger dialogue. So there's, you know, for people who uh, are new to the Guild or haven't joined the Guild or are a different kind of writer, it's like we've got this Guild, the Writers Guild of America. It, mm -hmm. um, we all join it when we write a TV script or, or a screenplay. So for as long as I've been a TV writer, you've been very active active in the guild. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, um, have you been like that for your whole career? Were you, like, were you running for office when you were in high school? I was student body president in high school. <laughs> yeah, so I was a senior. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you, I, I got involved with this at the guild with these kind of topics. It was really through uh, issues. And, and I'll just tell a quick story. Yeah. Is I, I was the number two writer on The Shield. You know, you have the showrunner who's in charge of the whole show. And then the number two is kind of that person's right hand. And, and they run the writer's room and kind of work up scripts and, and, and facilitate as much as they can. But they're kind of like the chief of staff, if you will, or something like that, trying to help the showrunner deliver the show. So I did that on The Shield and Sean Ryan, who was the creator showrunner of the show, and we had a writing team, these two women, very, very talented. And we um, sat down and, and we're giving them feedback one time, like at the beginning of the year. And we were saying, well, we want you to speak up more on the writing staff. And they said, watch what happens when we try to speak up. <laughs> so I went in in the morning. We hit the ground running like early that day and like through lunch, so maybe like three hours I didn't say a word. And just whenever they spoke, someone stepped on their line. The rest of the room was white guys. Somebody stepped on there, what they were pitching. People took their pitching. People said, honey, people cut it down. You know, they talked over them. And I was just observing it. And I realized that when somebody interrupted them, I immediately, my head turned to the guy. Like I was tuned 
to that male interrupter. So I was part of the problem. So I was, I was running the room and I was, I was not getting the most out of these writers. I was being unfair. I was biased. I didn't even realize it. So it's kind of like those scales that they, on that one occasion, fell from my eyes. And I said, mm -hmm. okay, I really need to correct this behavior. So I implemented a rule where when somebody was giving a prepared pitch, you know, you go off and you work up beats and you come in and pitch something. I would just say, let the person pitch and let's take notes and then we'll rip it up after they finish speaking. Mm -hmm. So I, I told that story. I was on a panel or whatever. I told that story and I got a, a tremendous amount of, of support. People said, oh, that happens to me too. Or thank you for saying that or whatever. And I was really kind of surprised. And then after a while, I, I ran for the, the board. I ended up doing this committee. You know, like, I didn't intend to go down this road, but what I found is that as a white, straight, able-bodied, middle-aged guy, as part of the, the power structure, people think it's interesting when I speak about sexism or racism or ableism. So I realized, okay, I should be using that power, that privilege, whatever you want to call it, to get other people on stage, to amplify those voices, to kind of help out as much as I can. Like, that's my role. I, I, I hope I'm not trying to toot my horn. I'm trying to explain that I feel there's a lot that white men can do to facilitate and, and just be supportive, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I think we have an obligation for that. So that, that's the point I'm trying to, to make. If, I understand uh, that. I do. Yeah. And I think, you know, maybe for, for some people that's interesting to kind of hear about how the power structure looks from the inside, because what you're describing, it feels really different from my experience. First of all, I came up in rooms that you know, I was the woman in the room that you're describing frequently. I would make it a game sometimes. Like I'm going to finish a sentence today <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? and it served me well, but I'm not that anymore. And showrunners have power in this industry to speak out and also to dig our heels in and to be inconvenient and difficult sometimes. I think, you know, that kind of comfort with power and with stepping into the leadership role that you reflect when you talk about that, it took me a little longer and it's just, a hierarchy. You know, what we're doing is we're just re reflecting white supremacist capitalist patriarchy for the kids at home. You know, mm -hmm. both of us come from a place of enormous privilege. And even within that, you know, part of the week wake up call for me over the past few years has been to say, like, it's not worth it if I'm just reinforcing a system that's this damaging. First of all, I don't want to hold myself up as someone who's doing so fucking amazing. I feel like I'm open to criticism and that I'm doing my best and I'm a student of this. But I did, I did have a moment many years ago where uh, we were casting a pilot that did not go to series. And the script that I had written, it was on, on a military base. There's a woman running the military base and she moved there with her, her husband, who was an officer. Originally, they were supposed to be a multiracial couple, that he was a black man and she was probably a white woman. We read all manner of actresses for this role and black African-American actresses kept coming in and saying, this role is really great. <laughs> like, I don't get to read for roles like this a lot. Uh -huh. And I really had this moment where I was like, well, when I wrote it, I did not know, <laughs> you know, right. that we would even be reading black women for this role. I didn't really think about it. Uh -huh. To me, that like crucial importance of writing dimensional roles was in front of mind. And the day that I heard that, and I heard it from three people auditioning in a row, I was just like, well, this, this role, we have to cast a black woman in this role. This is more important than some idea I had about talking about biracial couples. Mm -hmm. um, like that can wait because this is my moment right now where I can cast this role in a way that will, that it just felt right to me. I was in the privileged position of not understanding how sparse those roles were for women and for black women in particular. And so that was a moment where I was just like, you need to just pay more attention. We have decided on a path that's not just oh, how do we be the most creative we can be today? Like there is a social contract that I feel in mm -hmm. all of that. We do have to be mindful of what we put out there. What we put out there is really, really important to people. People see themselves either reflected mm -hmm. accurately or not reflected at all or reflected poorly. And that makes a difference to people. You know what I mean? We all have a responsibility to kind of, I think, examine our own writing because we, yes, we can feel the pressure of we want to get this done. We want to be good. You also dealing with notes and other people's expectations or whatever. And that can kind of push you into another, a certain box. And you're an established writer. I'm an established writer. We can push back. Yeah. A lot of younger writers can't push back. I will say one thing about what you said, which is that like, if there are any first time or about to be showrunners, people in development who are less experienced or newer to the business, 
find us, find showrunners who are more experienced. I certainly don't want all of these, uh, you know, like kind of the freshman class to come in and have to burn out fighting the fight of just stuff we've already been through. You know, you're a good example of this, but I know so many producers who are like you, who are just like, yeah, call me. I'm happy to skip you over this shitty mistake I made my first year, <laughs> you know, as yeah. a showrunner. Listen, showrunning is a really difficult job and there's a lot of ways to do it. And there's no written body of knowledge about, oh, this is how you do it. It's not like that. Hmm. And even though we have a manufacturing model of structure, when we make TV shows of budgets and schedules, every product is different. Every episode is different. We're not right. making a million shoes, which is no. when you use a production model. You know, people in other fields, other industries do have a lot of management training. Now, here in Hollywood, people are against management training because they think you're trying to screw up my creativity. You're mm -hmm. trying to put a box around me and that's going to hurt my creativity. And I need to, and, and so we have this auteur model. Well, that model has been around for a hundred years and it's led to a systemic abuse of people of color and women. The fucking horror stories I hear about people being verbally and physically assaulted is outrageous. Mm -hmm. So much so that you have to think, okay, that can't really be the case. But then when you hear a hundred cases, you're like, wow, okay, this playmaker mentality that anything goes has given a lot of people power and it's been abused. I will also just offer you my opinion about auteurs, which is that I think that's just a fucking dinosaur concept now. Like yeah. all of the cool kids are making stuff as a group. <laughs> like they're collaborating. People have an idea. People support that idea. There's plenty of credit to go around. It's There's something so stale and gross about it to me. I think we've all watched a generation of filmmakers, many generations of filmmakers be propped up and excused for their behavior because they think that all the magic is coming from one person, but anyone who has spent a day on a TV show or a movie will tell you that's not how it works at all. Hundreds of people are mm -hmm. all there bringing their A game. And the reason they're all there and being paid and in those positions is because it takes hundreds of people to make the product. It just does. Yeah, agree. That's a personal rant yeah. I enjoy to have. No, I, I agree content. with you. I think, especially in light of just the moment of history, the moment of time that we're in now, I will just say we're going to segue into, I think, moving the conversation into your creative process as a writer mm -hmm. um, and how these things are processed for just you, Glenn, when you sit down, you and the shitty blank page. But I will just put a little asterisk on this and say, um, the conversation that we've been having about racism and about what needs to happen in our industry is an ongoing one. So we don't think we just finished that conversation. We're just positive. No, 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 no. This is a creative conversation we're having for our writer Q&A series. We have not put any kind of punctuation on that sentence. We're just going to segue. So I'm very, I'm very curious to hear more about your transition from hospital administration to television writing. One of the things that I think made me a good showrunner is I worked in a hospital uh, uh, up until my er early 30s. I was a hospital administrator and I managed emergency rooms and ICUs in New York City. And I have a, a BA and a master's in English from uh, NYU. I wasn't sure. I thought I was going to be a novelist or a teacher. Mm -hmm. or I was, I was going to do something literary, let's say. And so I, I just started writing. I wrote bad screenplays and, and I was talking to someone because I didn't want to just be an isolated writer. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want to just sit in a desk and write a screenplay for two years and, and have it not go anywhere or something like that. You know, I didn't think I could support my family. And, and also I had these other skills. So my uh, wife's aunt said that, oh, well, kind of what you do at the job is like TV production. You should look at TV. And this was in the late 90s. So I learned how to write um, a spec script, you know, I, I wrote a, an ER, I managed an ER, so I had a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. I wrote a homicide. I have a brother who was a New York city cop. So I, I understood cops to some degree, you know, I was just kind of calling people that I thought could help me like, Hey, do you know somebody who could help me out? Can I call somebody? I was just kind of like, just trying to get, you know, a lead. And I ended up connecting with a, a, a manager who connected me with an agent. And then I came out in 1998 and had a pitch meeting at Nash Bridges. And I went in and I completely bombed. And I walked in wearing, uh, I swear, a black suit and tie because that's what you wear to a job interview in New York. Mm -hmm. So I had such a panic attack because the pitch was terrible. 
that I started gasping for air and I started sweating through the black suit. So they brought me into John Worth. He was the number two. They brought me into his office and like I got to lie down on his couch and they put like ice behind my neck and, and got, got me with some water. And they were like, you know, kid, you are trying way too hard. So they had mercy. They brought me back the next week. I sold them a pitch the next week. I had, oh I came in with like 30 pitches. That's one thing that I've always been able to do is just generate a lot of material. And it came in with 30 pitches. They thought I was going to come in with like three or four. So my wife and I and my son moved to LA and I was on that show for two years. And then I was out of work for a year and a half. I, I missed two consecutive staffing seasons. I couldn't get arrested. And because I was, I had now had a manager, an agent, and I was taking too many notes and I was kind of writing what I thought they wanted to read as opposed to what I thought was cool. Mm -hmm. and, and my writing was... The craft was better, but there wasn't any magic there. You know, yeah. there wasn't any fun or sloppiness. I think that's kind of important, you know? And then Sean, who I had written a number of scripts with on Nash Bridges, you know, he created The Shield and I was like the first writer he hired. But Sean as a showrunner didn't have a lot of management skills, but I did. So I was able to kind of help him figure out how to run that show. He was always the showrunner, but I would, I could kind of help manage things. So very quickly people ended up coming to me. What do you think I should do? How should I approach Sean about this or that? And that was the, the power dynamic on that on that show. This thing you're saying about taking too many notes and having scripts that are more technically functional, right? They're more correct, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they lose some of the magic. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? There's a tremendous amount of talent in Hollywood. And mm -hmm. I find that when people give notes, they usually give notes for clarity. Okay, how did the person get here? Should we set this up? Should we set that up? That kind of stuff. That's not why people watch shows. If you watch shows to see cool people do cool shit every episode. And you want to love these characters and they are outrageous and they are good at some things and they're horrible at other things and they're their own worst enemy and you want to watch them do it again next week. So what happens is a lot of the notes are about fine tuning, about clarity, and that kind of stuff can be technically proficient, but it doesn't surprise you. It takes the surprise out. But there's a desperation that young writers have of if I take these notes, it's going to get me a job. It's going to do something. That may or may not be the case. And you have to decide when you're writing a script, how do I want to be seen as a writer? And you want to be seen as having a voice. You're a showrunner. I'm a showrunner. You only get to hire four or five, six people. Why am I going to hire you? And if your notes are completely pushing your script to the middle, you're putting yourself in the middle of your competition. You might be further out there and now you're sort of eliminating yourself from a lot of jobs possibly. So it's a it's tricky balance. But you know, part of what we do as writers is we need to get lost in a dream space. We need to kind of just have something that's fun. That's what I mean about the magic. It's okay to take a chance. It's okay to kind of push yourself to do something surprising. When I was hiring for a mini room for Dark Tower, I hired three people I knew. Two people had been in a previous mini room. And then I read a hundred scripts to find one writer. And there were at least maybe five or six scripts that had this exact scene, okay? This exact scene. So there's a woman who is at her kitchen sink and she's doing her dishes and she's watching her son who is outside the window playing on, in the yard. And then she turns around to put something away and what she hasn't seen is a car drive up and dark shoes walk across her lawn and she comes back and she looks out the door and the, the, at the window and the swing is swinging and the car is driving off. Very plausible TV scene. Yeah. Every writer cuts immediately and then has FBI showing up and people are adding phones and they're adding wires. Why mm -hmm. did you see what was going on? So, you know, da, da, da. And they're putting the action after the cut. You, you have the character on stage under maximum stress and they do nothing, you cut. You're cutting for plot. You're furthering the plot you're, and you're keeping your character off stage. So whatever she does in that scene is not necessarily going to resolve the plot. It's not going to um, get the kid back because then the story's over, I understand that. But you have an opportunity to really show who you are as a writer, to differentiate yourself from other writers. And the thing I would suggest, because I think what you're saying is fucking fabulous and I'm gonna do it, because I cut away 
at the, I smash cut to the next thing all the time. And as an exercise, knowing that your first draft will be 95 pages long and you're going to cut a lot of it, just let yourself write the whole scene, you know, and you'll, you'll, you'll find a little gem somewhere in that you might not keep three pages, but you might keep one beautiful couplet that she says to herself in the empty room. Because we're always taught, get out of the scene as early as possible. Yeah. Not if it's a character moment. Like, ring it out. You've earned that character moment, and mm -hmm. then you can always cut it in editing or whatever, but try. Yeah, try, and try. we're not saying every single beginning and ending of every scene. We're saying apply this technique to find four or five of those in your script. Yes. And frankly, as a person who, I don't know if I've ever read a hundred scripts for one spot, spot, but I've probably read 50 or 60. I'm not asking for it to be perfect, like your sample so that I can decide if I'm gonna meet with you. I just wanna see a little spark. Oh, that person has a weird quirky mind. I need to meet with them and see if that will work well with the Tetris of the other weird quirky minds in the room. Exactly, and it's really, okay, what have we seen? What have we done? And how do you push that to be different? We had a scene mm -hmm. on Walking Dead where, you know, we had this bad guy and he captures um, Glenn and he's tied to a chair and they're beating him. Tell us where you came from. Where's your camp? That kind of stuff. How many times have we seen an interrogation where someone's tied to a chair and beat, right? Yes. A million times. I've never seen it with a zombie. So we did that and I was like, you know what? I would just go get a zombie. And so we, he comes in with a zombie on a leash and the zombie snapping, he's like, tell me what we need to know or I'm going to have this guy, you know, eat you. It was one of those things that that show, like the action wasn't really that original, but then we would just add zombie and then that, that got us over the hump. So much of writing is arduous, but this thing that we're talking about is a technique that's really fun. What you're talking about is the most purely creative aspect of what we do when we break story, which is just what is the craziest, weirdest thing that I've never seen before. How can I make this different than yeah. the thing that inspired it? Yeah, how can I make this something that I like? So you have to sort of write something that pleases you, that excites you, because the minute you don't, the minute you take all of these notes, what I find is the show shifts to become something that then you're not emotionally invested in fixing. So uh, a story problem happens and you have to have a lot of passion to be able to like, no, we're going to get it and it's going to be better. But sometimes mm -hmm. when you're working on a show and it becomes hacky or it's not something you care about, you're like, ah, it's good enough, you know? And, and, and then you're just, uh, you know, you're not being an artist. As somebody who's a lifelong passionate fan of fantasy, you know, I kind of find myself bristling when I see something and I feel like it's done cynically or yes. by committee, like there was certainly a moment in time where everybody was doing a vampire thing and mm -hmm. not all of them came from people's hearts. And I was just like, no, this is not what vampires are for, right? I would, I, this is the sort of stuff that makes me a 16 year old fangirl. I just want it to come from a genuine place. I mean, when you talk about genre, it's like, I, I feel like it's the, uh, the modern version of the storytelling that people did around the fire in the mm -hmm. cave painting, you know, so archetypal and so psychological. So our responsibility to it is to be really personal. Again, not an auteur. The Magicians was the weird mutated baby of all of the stuff about fantasy that I loved, all of the stuff about fantasy that my partner John was discovering because he wasn't sort of a natural born fantasy fan and all the stuff he brought to it. And then a room full of geeks of various kinds each talking about the thing that they get excited about, the comic books that they like to buy. That's fun. So fun, right? I'm sure yeah. your one was like that too. I mean, was Damien your last genre? No, you did um, the Amazon thing since, right? Yeah, it was, it was it. It was kind of like trying to figure out how are we going to put this world together? And, and it was a team effort. I was talking to another showrunner who just had a show. Somebody pulled the plug on their show. And they mm -hmm. said, you know, Hollywood is like Lucy pulling the football from Charlie Brown. <laughs> Th that's yeah. all it is. So I've been a showrunner now, including that pilot five times, you know, I've had, mm -hmm. I've created two shows and I'm happy with my career or whatever that you always live in a level of frustration. But you know, I had worked on that show for three years. It wasn't picked up. So what do you do? You go to a blank notebook, you know, I write by hand and uh, I have for you a, a, a stack of my notebooks that are currently different projects and stuff. I want to say to the young writers or the people, you know, starting out, mm -hmm. you know, you think that you're going to get to a position 
in which you get everything you want. You know, that's not going to happen. You're always going to live in a level of frustration. You're always going to live in a, a zone of wanting to tell some other story and not knowing how quite to get it out. And that's part of the drive. That's part of the thing. And, and it happens to everybody. That's something we have to get used to. And unlike other crafts where you're kind of dependent on somebody, the writer can just open up a file or pull out a notebook and just start jotting down ideas and chasing this one or chasing that one. And that's empowering. That's fantastic. Whether or not it gets made, that sometimes that's out of your hands, but at least you can set that path. And if I could do my career over, I would have chased less gigs or like, I think I would have generated more original content. I think I would have done that. You know, when I started, you didn't write original scripts. You wrote spec scripts. You know, the one original script I wrote, my agent looked at me and said, what the fuck is this? I would just push people to really tell their stories and, and just keep pushing. I think that that's the value of what we do, a part of the value, a big part of what we do. You know, when I was a, a very young writer starting out and I didn't know very many people and I didn't, I hadn't met you yet um, or anyone like me yet, that feeling of being stuck and thinking this work isn't good enough. I can't get it. I frequently had anxiety that it meant I wasn't a good writer and I wasn't supposed to be doing this. It's like, I also couldn't stop. So I, it wasn't like a real threat, but it did make me feel bad about myself. Uh, you know, I can't get no satisfaction and that's a problem inside of me. Like I probably need therapy for it or something. And as I've matured into a life of being a writer, I've realized, no, that's just what it feels like. That's just actually the life you signed up for. Yeah. Part of my process when I'm writing, I go through stages, okay? So I used to go through a stage before I start writing a script where I'm really irritable and, and just anxious and I have to get into the writing zone, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't have that as much. I started Transcendental Meditation last year. So the idea that I can just kind of flip a switch and start meditating, I've been able to just like, oh, I'm just going to sit down and write. So but I was able to use that to get past that anxiety, right? But now when I write, you know, and I write differently. Sometimes I write on the computer. Most of the time I write on paper. And so sometimes I just write the first 10 pages over and over. Sometimes I'll write it out of order, whatever. It, it, every script is different. There's no process. And I've stopped beating myself up for not having a process. I used to really beat myself up. And, and, and when I was on Walking Dead, a lot of the producers and the writers thought I was the Antichrist because I didn't really have a process. You mm -hmm. know, and I was a showrunner and I was trying to figure out how to run that show after taking it over. So there was a lot of pushback and I felt really shitty about myself that I don't have a process. Like, why am I not there? But that's just, you know, that's right. just my, my thing. So then what happens is I start writing and then I really fall in love with the script. I'm like, this script is the best script I've ever written. <laughs> And then just around 80% of the, I'm like, this script is the worst script ever written in history. And I need to go back to working in a hospital. I'm a horrible person and I am worthless and I hate myself and I'm a fraud. Like I, I, The amount of self-loathing, I cannot explain to you. Then I get over that and then I finish the script. And then I'm like, this script is the best script I've ever written. I'm in love again. So one time I went to an editor on a show and I came in and I said, I got to tell you, I just finished a script. It's the best script I've ever written. And he goes, oh my God, Glenn, you fucking say that every time. And I said, no, I don't. And then, I, and then he said, yeah, you do. And I said, I guess it's true. I do think that. So it's, it's this up and down of, you know, I'm the shit. I'm total shit. I'm the shit. I'm total shit. Pretty much everyone <laughs> I know in this, who is a writer sounds like you. Yeah, like, it's so crazy. Ed, I think editors hear it as much as anybody. We're in there when we think it's the worst. We're desperately trying to fix our fuck ups. And they just patiently sit there as we go through a long dark night of the soul about our entire presence on planet Earth as we try to fix every scene. <laughs> If writers can somehow get into an editing room, you know, a young writer in a writer's room is very focused on story, but a lot of the magic comes together in editing. You know, you could drop lines, you could move things around, you could add music, you know, so you have more tools, storytelling tools than you are cognizant of as a young writer. That's something that if people could get access or whatever, like a young staff writer, if you could even say, hey, I don't want to give my opinion, but can I just sit in a, a, an editing bay with you and, and soak it up? That's really, really helpful. It will transform how you write a script because you will understand that they have to shoot every word you say you, and you will start to visualize things on a much more precise level. Yes, and you'll start writing more visually because... 
you know, you don't need to have the actor respond to everything. You could just write, you know, on Sarah, you know, mm -hmm. smiling or whatever. And you just know they're going to have that shot, you know, like I right. kind of edit on the page like that. Exactly. So I'm going to ask you a question that's kind of big and a little vague and you can answer it however you want, but you've been putting yourself through this, the joys and the private agonies of being a writer for about how many years now? Uh, 22. Why are you a writer? Like why writing? Why, why is that the thing for you? To be honest, I will just say, I don't know. I just always knew I was going to be a writer. Like when mm -hmm. I was a kid, like I loved reading. I loved telling stories. I think I, I have the ability to tell a story. And I also have a, an ability to feel other people's pain. Mm -hmm. And I can get that on the page. But I don't feel I ever consciously made a choice to be a writer. I think mm -hmm. it was more of a recognition that I was a writer. Is there anything else I should ask you? Do you have a little farewell hot tip for the writers out there or anything? Is there something else we should be covering? One of the things I will want people to take away is here you have a, a certain level of, of achievement within the Hollywood system. And we're still carrying around our demons. You have those demons all the time. You have them when you're writing. You have them when you're not writing. They're inherently questions of self-worth and what is the worth of your work and all of that. I would say to people that if you look at what's out there right now and you look at what's being written in novels and, and work, there's so much great work being done that it's really anything goes. There, there are a lot fewer rules than you think it is, but you can find the path. Like you can learn the craft enough or whatever, but I think writers who are nervous about doing this, it's like, just g give it a shot. You know, go ahead and write that script. If it's not any good, you could, you know, stick it in your drawer. You know, I have scripts that I've never shown anybody and you write another one and you get a little bit better. It's a lot less linear than yeah. we think it is. That you go from step to step to step. You know, it's a lot of, it's more of a circling mass. And we're just kind of, you and I are a little further in the pool <laughs> than the people just coming into the pool. You know what I mean? We're a little more mm -hmm. at the deep end, but it's a lot messier. And, and I think it's, it's kind of liberating to think about, you can really write whatever you want to write, as long as, you know, you want to be responsible, you want to be entertaining, you have all these things, but you can, you can start anywhere. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I'm trying to, you know, be encouraging to people and just say like, don't worry, your demons are your demons. They're not the reader's demons. They're not the audience's demons. They're your yeah. demons. You can put them over there and just get started.